All right, everyone, welcome again to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you want to support these programs, you have many, many, many options. You can join the channel directly at YouTube at multiple levels. You could head over to patreon.com slash Aksum, A-K-S-U-M. You know the deal. Today, our guest is Hunter Miller. Welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. I, um, I, I don't even remember now uh, exactly how I came across you but I have been basically instantaneously following anybody involved with Urbit. I, I bought a planet about a year ago and then sat on it until a few weeks ago and, and finally launched my ship. And you're the reason behind that because you're, uh, at least, and you'll explain to us and my audience, uh, one of the people, if not the person behind Port, which is what I used and I would not have done well in the command line. <laughs> um, so, um, why don't you, why don't, we're going to get there, but why don't you rewind and, and tell us, you know, how you got into the, the field of engineering. I always like to go to a larger club. Oh, was it, was it something sure. like, uh, the, the answer to your question, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up when you were a kid? Um, sort of. So like when I was a kid, I thought, um, I kind of thought that I would, be like an architect or a scientist um those always like came up randomly um and in some ways i'm both now <laughs> um but honestly like the straightforward answer is that like i went into i was going to college and i, I couldn't i couldn't decide i just wanted to build stuff and so um i actually started mechanical engineering oh, okay. um but i kind of I don't know. I got an impression of the field. Maybe it wasn't the right one, but I thought like, you know, most of these guys are probably just sitting in Excel, like making sure like the safety numbers are right or, you know, whatever, getting tolerances and all this stuff. So I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. I mean, maybe they see some of the building, but um, I just wanted to like get my hands dirty, so to speak. And so like, I, and I, I really wasn't doing well in school. Like I just, I wasn't, um, I don't know, getting out of high school, I was just like, not really motivated to go. Um, but it was kind of the thing that you did. So, but you must have had some some skill at it, right? You don't just jump into engineering, or like some people don't have an aptitude for it, right? From Yeah, I mean, I, I had always like built stuff as a child, like, um, you know, I don't know, like potato guns and different things. And just like, um, I mean, two crossbows out of pencils. Right. Yeah, exactly. So like, that was kind of my childhood. Um, and I was good at math. And so it, it made sense. Um, but yeah, like, so it was just a tough time for me. I ended up like dropping out for a year. And I was like, I gotta just like, go figure out who I am and like what life is before I get into this. And so um, and then I came back and I was like, I was always good at computers. Like, um, I did programming when I was a kid. And like, it just made sense. Like I read Hackers and Painters by Paul Graham and uh, it's like a collection of essays that he wrote. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, as a kid, they, they were really like, they made a big impression on me. And so that's kind of when I made the decision to like pursue, you know, computer science and really just like software development. That, that's awesome. And, and now there's so many, different avenues in which you can enter it um you know you, you see it through the many different boot camp givers and, oh, yeah. and various uh universities so you just took courses at your university and then like your first gig was just getting a gig based off the university education or did you do any of the self-taught courses online um so university at least for computer science where i went is very like um old school programming, like kind of theoretical. Um, and so it's like, it's like nothing like what day to day, like practical engineering is. So um, I really had to learn that myself. Um, and so when I got out of school, there actually weren't a ton of software jobs. So I actually went into IT for like six months while I was like looking for, you know, a software job. Um, and I lucked out in that, like, there was an advertising agency looking for, uh, like, a web developer. Mm -hmm. um, 
And while I was on my IT job, like I was trying to learn web because like it sounded cool, but there was just like no exposure in our, in our classes. So I was just like, what is this thing? Like, it seems like a lot of people are, you know, going towards it. And so, um, yeah, like that's basically how I got started was doing web development at like a marketing agency, building all kinds of websites. And, you know, it's not like, <clears throat> it really wasn't like, the programming that like I learned in school at all. It was very like, you know, um, just put things together, like make it work, you know, not like thinking about algorithms or any of that kind of stuff. So you, you kind of learned it on the fly mostly, or did you like go to the library and get, I don't know, web development for dummies? No, like there, there was starting to be more and more like online tools, kind of like you were talking about. Um, I didn't do a boot camp, but, the code Academy had just come out. Mm -hmm. And so I started like going through that. Cause I was like, Oh, this is pretty good. And like get a feel for HTML and JavaScript. And then like, once I got to the agency, like I was kind of like basically paid to like learn on the job as I was like doing things. So it was perfect because like, that's awesome. Yeah. I just was like, you know, in taking videos like as fast as possible. And then like, you know, trying to figure out what I, what I need to do. And then honestly that first, like, two or three years i just spent a lot of time after work doing the same thing <laughs> i just really wanted to like ramp up and like get started in my career and like be good at it and you know that's kind of what it took that's good so yeah so you th that's something that i hear a lot from developers that i don't hear as much from other professions is that because the computer is so much a part of our lives that even after hours like i imagine it you're saying you sound like a self-starter so it wasn't the company kind of imposing crazy hours on you that no maybe, not at all <laughs> it's your own sort of curiosity right. pursuit yeah like i mean don't get me wrong like agencies you definitely will work some crazy hours depending on you know how they're run but um like we had a we had a project where we launched a website and i mean it was we were there for like 24 hours <laughs> it's like it was rough but um yeah no they weren't it, this was not them at all it was just like i just wanted to be good at what i did um i've always had like some motivation to like care about craft and things like that um so yeah that's awesome and and so at at some point you interact with the urban sphere and um join the, the talon corporation could you tell me how you first heard of of talon because i think the the way in which people hear about it is seems varied from different people that i've spoken to and gotcha. um, it's yeah. always an interesting story um so i i don't know let's see i've been on twitter I don't know for a while I, I honestly around when i got started as a web developer because there was a lot of people um that were web developers like putting out pretty good content on twitter mm -hmm. now it's a lot more of like drama and flame wars and stuff <laughs> but i mean there's still good content out there too but um you gotta so use that's that why i got on it really yeah <laughs> um so and the other part of this is that like i love anything weird like people that are just off the wall are like my favorite people um Me especially I mean, them characters yeah <laughs> just like anything esoteric is like totally my vibe so um i just started following crazy amounts of people on twitter um i'm sort of like a i don't know sometimes a conspiracy junkie so like that mm -hmm. helps too and so just like all of that combined I ended up seeing bits of Urbit like pop up on my timeline every now and again, probably, I don't know the exact date, but probably like 2018, 2019 is when it really started to pop up. And then like once um, kind of the landscape that you know of now came out, I think that was really when I started to see it a lot. But honestly, like, I would see it and I had no idea what it was. I was like, what is this? Like, it's so weird looking and like, it seems simple, but like, it also seems like a big deal. And like, so I don't know there, why I got the that word deal. Urbit first or the word Tlon first. Urbit for sure. Urbit, yeah. Um, 
And so I uh, would bounce off the docs. Like I hit urban.org a couple times. I was like, man, what is this? And I was like, it was just like, you know, it'd be like at a random time. I didn't have time to like dig in or whatever, or just like brush it off. So I was like, I don't know what this is. Um, but then eventually, like, I think it was like once people started getting like banned a lot more on Twitter and like post-election stuff and then like Trump got banned on Twitter and I don't know, there was just a lot happening. And I was like, man, like that urban thing sounded like something t like going towards getting rid of this kind of style of stuff. So I was like, let me just go back and see what it is. And I just dove like straight in. Um, I read through like the whole guide and I like listened to that understanding urbit podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, I think like, you know, there was, that was the only thing I listened to for like the next two days. <laughs> and, you know, eventually I found, you know, who was making it salon, um, as well. So, but they kind of like, I didn't dig deep into what, who and what they were exactly, yeah. um, for a while. And I met a lot of the people that worked there through Urbit. Um, but it wasn't until I started like working on port that that kind of joining Talon kind of came into the picture. Yeah, speaking of the esotericness that that you've said, I've definitely been that person who grew up on fantasy and sci-fi. And so uh, <laughs> anything esoteric uh, and mysterious looking too. Right. Uh, I couldn't help but like look up what the name is and I come across and from what I understand it's it's from the short story of Jorge Luis Borges and I don't know is that required reading or is there anything that you want to say about that um it is now I think like it was suggested before but I think it's actually in the manual now that you're supposed to read it <laughs> <laughs> it's a wild story and I, it, honestly it kind of scares me <laughs> And that you could release this, you know, thing that kind of takes over the world. Um, in the story, it almost seems like a bad thing, but maybe it could be a good thing too. Yeah, that's right. I think technology, at least in my opinion, is is always functional. It's always what you make of it. As my generation right. gets older, I see so many people doing the boomer-like move of you know, immediately saying, for example, that TikTok is to be written off because mm -hmm. it's for mm -hmm. little kids. And I, I'm i honest, like when I first opened TikTok, I, I thought, wow, uh, this is killing my attention span um, instantly. I can't do this. But I stopped myself and said, no, I'm sure there's some something you can do right. with this. I, now, I still haven't done that yet. <laughs> I've, I've played around with it a little more. Um, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, it's, it's more functional. It's, it's what you can do about it. So since I mentioned it and you mentioned it too, can, can you tell my audience what port is and the different ways in which you can access Urbit and maybe even along with that, what Urbit is? Yeah, for <laughs> sure. So we'll go way back. So what Urbit is, is a whole story. Um, and, you know, it's, kind of rethinking from the ground up what a computer is and um, especially a networked computer. So, you know, what we're doing now, you know, talking over the internet, um, it's a it, kind of like a reinvention of what that is. And just from thinking from first principles um, and trying to accomplish it in a way that's super simple and easy to kind of like maintain and debug. And so what has been created um, is basically an operating system, kind of like Windows or Mac or Linux, except it's very odd um, comparatively, but it runs on top of any of those other operating systems for now. Um, hopefully one day it can run your whole computer with nothing else, but um, it runs on top of them. It acts as if um, it's acts as kind of like a server. So in the same way that I'm connecting to Google server right now to talk to you. Um, instead, I may one day connect to an Urbit to talk to you, which we technically can do right now, actually. Um, 
although it doesn't have all the nice features of Google. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I look forward to it having all the nice features because I will yeah. instantly change. <laughs> right. So there's a lot of hurdles um, in trying to make things simple. Um, that is actually really difficult. And so one thing that we have trouble dealing with right now is like binary data, like video streams, because in the language that was built to represent Urbit, um, right now there's not a good way to kind of efficiently and performatively like represent that data um, in a manner that can be computed really quickly. So we have kind of a team or I should say it's really just one guy right now, but hopefully a team later that can help him kind of get that to completion. Cause then we could really do like, you know, stuff like this. Um, so for right now, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of the backing of something that's a lot similar to discord. Um, amongst other apps, there's plenty of other apps. You can play chess, poker, um, you can add pals and things like that, but the main thing people do is kind of chat. Um, cause that's kind of like the, I guess like the primary use case of the internet really is like talking with other people. Um, and it fits the kind of data model of the computer right now. Yeah. So from what I've seen, there's the command line, there's port and there's the visor, which does it out of the browser. Of, of these three, which one do you use? Like, do you use port yourself or do you I use, do use port? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I do use the command line as well. So, um, so yeah, I guess I should say <clears throat> the way that Urbit works right now is that you have a small program called Urbit, um, which actually runs on your computer. And so whether you're using port or the command line, actually both use the same little program. Um, and if you're kind of tech savvy, you might use the command line, um, or if you're like hosting something on a server, uh, it's kind of the same thing you would use the command line, uh, to boot it up, but most people aren't comfortable with that. And so, um, when I first got onto Urbit, I actually started making a host and I was like, well, I could do this, but it's like, who's going to want to get on if they've never like seen anything from Urbit before? Like, there's gotta be a way to like get on and try it. Um, and I was working on another app at the time with similar kind of functionality. And so I, um, was like, what if we just take the urban binary and put it in an app and wrap it in like a, you know, user interface and people were like immediately resonated with the idea. And I was like, oh, well, okay, this is, seems good. <laughs> so like, I just started hacking on it for like a couple of weeks and had something that like kind of worked. Um, and that was when I approached the foundation to get a grant um, to build port. So port is not Urbit. It's just a thing that runs Urbit for you. Um, and we need to do a better job of like communicating that. Um, meaning, meaning it's like a, it's an independent project of you via a grant from the foundation, but it's not an official foundation project. Um, it is an official foundation project. Like they actually own it now. Um, oh, okay. Most grants, the way that it works is that you do a contract and the work that you're doing is for the foundation. Okay. You get paid for the work in stars, um, or rap stars now, but yes, you do, you know, grant them license to use it. Um, and so, uh, what I did was kind of just wrap around the urban binary so that you don't have to mess with the command line because, you know, maybe there's maybe like 10% of people who are, you know, used to doing that. Um, so the way that I run Urbit is I've set it up in a server, um, you know, like in the cloud basically. And my server just runs out there. And then I use port just as like, a management interface and i just like i like using it day to day so that i know like issues mm -hmm. that pop up and things like that um it so i just use it as kind of a browser for a bit um also kind of hate the tab model um i don't know especially with urbit it just doesn't feel right like mm -hmm. i kind of want an app like in its own window 
And so on port, you can do that. On the browser, you, you'd have to kind of manually manage that. Um, unfortunately, the browser doesn't give a lot of good control over like managing Windows um, because of security risk. So yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And do you foresee, I mean, it's hard to say so early on, but do you foresee like other ways that people might want to get on or do you think the, like this is enough, these kind of three options? Um, so I think, well, we haven't talked about hosting. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing that's coming. The problem is that Urbit, the way it runs and exists right now is not very, um, it's not very amenable to hosting because you have to have this constantly running process that can only ever be one. And it actually is kind of, um, it needs more memory than anything else. And that's one of the most expensive things in cloud computing. So to run a host right now, it's actually kind of tricky, um, but it's a very easy way to get on because you can just sign up for a service, click go, and then they'll boot your ship for you and you have no worries. You don't have to worry about your ship running and they'll even do support. So that's something that is a problem for port right now is that like you can run it with port, but like there's no good avenues for you to find ways to fix your ship if something happens and things are going to happen. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the best thing right now is like you boot another comment and then you go in Urbit community, like the group chat and say like, hey, something's wrong with my ship. Um, but there's still things that I need to build into port that actually help you do some of these things, um, you know, to troubleshoot or to actually make a fix. Yeah, I, you know, I, I undersold myself a little bit. I ran into a snag, but I figured it out pretty, nice. pretty quickly. I think it was probably something on the back end with it just loading. Yeah. Because uh, I was just setting up all my identity stuff with Bridge. Um, mm -hmm. And the wallet, which makes me think of other things that I <laughs> would like <laughs> to ask you for the audience. Um, just on this point that you had mentioned that you get paid in, in stars with the grant fellowship. And that's one of the things we didn't talk about. Can you can you talk about Urbit as digital land and the difference between, from like the range of levels from you mentioned now comets oh. from star to comet yeah so i i left out a whole piece <laughs> which is that on top of this network computer um is a whole built-in identity system um and that's important for a variety of reasons but the main one is what do you do at every website right you go make an account that identifies you and so this smooth like everything out honestly like it makes everything easier because it's like i have this identity i know exactly you know what it is so an identity in urbit is split up into like three well five levels but we'll say we'll say three for now so there's galaxies which are the the most rare you could say and then stars and then planets <clears throat> now there's two other things which is moons which can be off of a planet and then comets. And so there's 256 galaxies, 65-ish thousand stars, and then 4 billion planets. Each planet can spawn 4 billion moons. And the comets are like pretty much limitless. It's like 2 to the 128 or whatever. Um, I think that's like more than the universe has atoms or something. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so anyway, most people will be buying a planet as mm -hmm. their identity because it's a permanent identity on the network. Um, it's kind of like the minimum required, you know, to actually operate as like a person that can stay on the network and things like that. Um, stars above them can spawn planets and they also route packets or will at some point, they don't right now. Um, and they also provide what are called updates or OTAs. And then galaxies at the very top um, can spawn stars and planets too, technically. Um, and they provide kind of the, the very top layer of routing. So 
Um, you can think of them kind of like DNS root nodes, if you know what that is. It's like, you know, how do I know where google.com is? Well, I have to talk to something that tells me what IP address that is. And galaxies are kind of the same way. They provide, you know, the very, if anything else fails, it's like go to the galaxy and see where is this person and potentially route your traffic through the galaxy to get to that person. If so are there galaxy and star owners who are doing that right now? Or you're saying that's something that's down the line? No, that's right now that's happening. So um, all of the gal, well, I don't know about all of them, but most of the people who own galaxies are given kind of special information on like how to run it, what servers to run them on. Um, all of them have a static IP address that you can find. That's how your orbit knows where to go to find them. Um, and right now they do all the routing for the network because we're so small. Um, eventually that won't be able to happen. <laughs> They'll have to rely on the stars and really that's what they're there for. Um, and the stars, you know, Maybe one day they'll charge for this. Maybe they won't still yet to be determined. There's a lot as far as like making money on their bit, but that's a whole nother. Yeah, I, I need to do a lot point. more research myself because I don't know what star and what galaxy I'm connected to. Yeah, so right. So you have a sponsor as a planet or a star. Um, generally, if you're a planet, your sponsor is a star. Um, and that's who gives you updates. Um, and then also they point you to the galaxy so that star has a sponsor which is a galaxy um and gives them updates and routing and stuff like that yeah so you you get paid via the grant in stars and and have stars as you said now is that something that in the like interim whether you want to speak on a personal level level or on a generic level how other people would look at it and approach it is that something that you're trying to like change for us cash or other cryptocurrencies or do you hodl as if it's bitcoin because of <laughs> the long-term efficacy of urbit right i think it's mostly the last one but i mean obviously like some people just need cash mm -hmm. um and so right now it's a lot easier to get cash for stars um because a group separate from talon and the foundation um decided that like there should be a token which represents a star because a star is it's just like any uh, other nft on the ethereum blockchain like it's a crypto asset sorry I'm, i skipped that but all of the urbit id is backed on ethereum blockchain currently um except we just released something that kind of brings it kind of onto urbit sort of um to make planets cheaper and because ethereum gas fees are ridiculous um but anyway so yeah i experienced that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sure i got really lucky like when i first joined and i got a planet for 15 bucks it was like right before gas went crazy um so anyway we kind of got lost where i was so okay you're talking about how it's all on the ethereum blockchain right. So some people thought that it'd be really nice if there was a token which represented stars that could be fractionalized like money, uh, which makes a lot of sense. And so they released a contract which does this and it accepts stars from people as like, you know, you input a star and you get a token out and it's uh, a Wooster WSTR. Um, and now you can take that because it's a token just like any other um you can go to uniswap and trade your booster for ethereum and then obviously ethereum you can get money and all that kind of stuff so actually that opens up a lot of opportunity for the foundation because now they can pay people fractionally um, they can put a cash value out there and then just give them whatever the booster current you know trading is when they finish their grant um, and then if the person wants, they don't have to trade it for cash. They could just go to the same contract and say, here's one booster and get out a star. And then now, you know, they can run that star, spawn planets and all that kind of stuff. That's awesome. <laughs> That's yeah, that it's, 
it, there are two different approaches that people could have to be there. Earlier on, a string that, that we touched on that I wanted to get back to is um, you mentioned that some of the things that sparked your interest in Urbit were some of the censor censorship things that you have been seeing. And I, I see that as one group of people that would be flocking to Urbit were people who want control over their data, over their computer, over their servers, everything like that. Is fleeing or you know defending against censorship the the only kind of big draw? Or what other things you think would draw my audience and others to Urbit? I mean, I think that's a big one. Um... A lot of people, just for whatever reason, like are in, you know, in danger of being canceled or censored or whatever you want to say. And so, like, there's a real need for something like this. Um, and you know, we're trying to build it. Um, I think other things that Urbit does aren't fully realized yet, but um, we're getting there. And so, one of them is like all your data is stored on your Urbit. And this actually unlocks a lot of things that your normal computer doesn't do because you've moved a lot of your computing off to software services on the web. And now all your data is on their servers and it's not accessible by you in an easy way, like in a extremely convenient way. You know, it's probably like you could export it out or things like that. I mean, some services are better than others. Um, but once you have all your data on your machine, well, now you can do like a global search across everything on your computer. And like, where was that message? Like, that's the kind of stuff that like really bothers people day to day, but like they can't figure it out because nothing like the interop between all these services is non-existent for the most part. Um, and like just integrations as well. Um, this is something that we're hoping to tackle like soon um which is that like we can probably start composing programs that people write together in ways that give them more capabilities by just like adding on someone else's app that like you know injects some button on your chat that lets you you know send them money or whatever um there's all kinds of stuff that we could do and that's not necessarily unique but to like to herb it but its environment i think is more suited to doing things like that yeah and that that's certainly gonna cause the proliferation of creators there's there's a million different options people have now i was just off a conversation with a friend who's a, a, a much newer podcaster and, and kind of public writer he's uh, in academe and um in conversation with him, I told him like, you know, right now you can choose to go the Substack route. And, you know, right now it seems like they are interested in not censoring people and promoting that. And some of their top people have uh, even caught flack for that. Or you can go on Twitter and they have like an alternative Twitter version of that. And you can try your best there as you see everybody right. getting kicked off. But I told them, look, man, the only long-term solution is Urbit. And I told them we're going to talk about it today and and so yeah when you get those features where people can be compensated more and and more efficiently and and more directly without having to go to other people's servers i think i think that's going to be huge to drawing people there and then it's you know just about marketing and branding instead of us uh, people who like the weird and the esoteric you know right. <laughs> getting <laughs> on our bit <laughs> yeah so like you know right now it's that it's that group but you know, we have to let and encourage, you know, the people that we don't like on too, because like they need better computing just as much as we do. <laughs> and, you know, like, um, yeah, besides just the, the grants, like there's also like, there's funding now, like you can start a business on Urbit and get funded through the combine. Um, I don't think they're the only ones either. I'm sure there's others that just aren't public, you know, out there. But if you if you put something out there that's good, like people will probably, you know, want to talk to you. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love the 
digital land of opportunity there that's available. I, I see you have also the project about urban cards. Um, and they seem to be paused right now, but hopefully <laughs> coming back soon. Can you, can you talk about what, sure. what that is? It looks very sleek. I'm, I'm, nice. I'm not quite sure what it does yet because <laughs> I haven't used that one as I have used port, but it looks incredibly sleek. And I don't know if it's like you can get into a physical space using an urban ID one day or something so like that's that. That's the dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now it's just, it's just art. It's uh it's just a fun little knickknack to have um, like a physical version of, I have one right here. It's a little dusty, but you can see, oh, that's awesome. if I can get it. Yeah. So this is one it's um aluminum. Uh, turn this way. So I kind of made this design on the back. Um, but this front part is if you log into Bridge, um, you will see this pop up on Bridge. And the first time I saw it, I was like, that is beautiful. Like, it just looks like something so, like, interesting and awesome. So, like, this right here is what's called a sigil. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically a representation of your Urbit ID. Mm -hmm. And so this right here... Uh, under my finger Not um, six last rule. that's me so this combination of letters is um a kind of syllabalized you know verbal form of my address on the network which is really just a number um and so the sigil itself is kind of like a art representation of that same number and then um all these little dots and shapes or is actually like the public ethereum address interpreted as symbols um on the face of the card and so when i saw this i was like man it'd be so cool to have a real one <laughs> yeah it's it it's i feel like it grants you access to something maybe it's just yeah. like you haven't unleashed it into the world yet but it it um it it un it unlocks and unleashes something and it gets you access to whatever that something is. You mentioned the length of the name, and that's the, the mm -hmm. name of your planet, uh, not necessarily any of your stars. Can you talk about how you, we ran the full gamut there from stars to comets, right? The three versus the five, the stars, planet, uh, is it galaxy, star, planet, and then the moons and comets as this the smaller version. It's the, the comet, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. That's what you designed port to have people play with without having to purchase anything. Um, so comments existed before I ever came into the picture. Um, okay. They were just intended as a non-permanent. So you cannot, if you screw something up, you can't reset or anything like you might be permanently messed up. So to prevent spammers, right, we don't want... Um, we want you to have an ID, like a real one that you mm -hmm. actually have a stake in the reputation of. Um, comments are like the opposite of that. So they're intended to be used as like bots or like, you know, something ephemeral that you don't really care about if it crashes and burns. Um, so. Wait, what was your sorry? What was your question? Well, there are people in history. Sometimes people say some of the great men of history are known only by their first name, whereas, you know, the lesser men are known by their full names. So there's different lengths of names. Oh, from yeah, yeah, yeah. Comet. You showed us the length of your name, which is of a planet, uh, not necessarily any stars you may or may not own uh, or may or may not have cashed out. So can you talk <laughs> to us about the length of names and like what that relationship with the length of names and, and uh, you know, it looks like prestige to me, right? Like it looks like shorter the name the more yeah. the speech because it's easier to remember right yeah it, it, it certainly feels that way right <laughs> um, sorry say that again i said it certainly feels that way like yeah when you see like a little short one it's like oh man that's cool um <laughs> so there's um i want to say 512 um suffixes and prefixes uh and those are what make up the syllables of the name. So a galaxy has a three letter syllable. Um, and I believe it's the suffix. I don't know, I always get them mixed up. The suffix um, is the latter one. Right, but I think it's actually, um, so there's a zero 
which is D-O-Z, Daz. Um, and Zod is the other zero. Um, and so Da Zod is zero, zero. So, but all the galaxies are technically Da's and then the suffix. So Da Zod, Zod being zero is the first primary galaxy. Um, and so all the galaxies are three letters, um, just one syllable. And then the stars are two syllables, so six letters. Um, and then planets is double that. So uh, 12 or 12 letters, four syllables. <laughs> and then I don't know how many uh, moons and comets are. Um, it's a lot. But they basically take, you know, two syllables dash, two syllables dash, um, just to find the number. And so, yeah, comets um, are perfect for trying out. I don't know if I should say perfect, but they're good for trying out Urbit because like it's free. You can just boot one up at any time you want. Um, and so that's kind of like what I push in port, um, you know, start without an ID um, because it's free. And hopefully hosting can get to a point where like it's cheaper to host an Urbit. Um, there's potentially some work that can be done to make Urbits a lot easier to run in like a cloud environment, like a more cloud native Urbit system. Um, and then maybe we'll have free trials and people can just at the click of a button, like not even have to boot, like it'll already be done or something like, I don't know. The, the world is like our oyster. <laughs> it's just, you know, we gotta do the work. Hey, Amen, we gotta do the work. And I, I want to shift gears a little bit and, and close out with some talk to you about video games, but before, uh, okay. and board games, but be before we, we move on, is there anything I missed about Urbit or any other calls to action? I, I think that's a good call to action. It's free. So use it. Like that's, <laughs> that's an awesome call to action. Yeah, is there anything sure. else we, we missed about Urbit that you um, plug hmm. or pump? Yeah, good question. I would say like, if you like building things, um, there's a ton of like low hanging fruit that are just laying around that you could do on Urbit right now. Like Hoon School is about to start up, I think like literally Thursday. I'm signed um, up. I don't know if you can like still get in, but like, <laughs> at the very least, like I think all of the materials and like the education right now is just like, being pushed as much as possible. So like you can get on, you can learn the language that Urba is written in Hoon. Um, and yeah, I don't know, like you can build simple apps and people will start using them. Like there's just, it's not a big community. So like all the opportunity is there and there's like real, real money on the table. <laughs> well, and I you certainly can, like, like I don't know, you yeah. know, you can, own your own computer and feel good about it. <laughs> I like the sound of that. And I hope other entrepreneurially minded or, you know, autodidactic folks out there. And, and this is not even true autodidactism. Like it's, it's a lesson being taught, but there will certainly be some areas where you'll have to be self-taught. Take that, that hint and message. It stuck out to me that shifting gears that you are a, a fan of, uh, D and D. Some of my favorite books growing up were from the Forgotten Realms, and oh, yeah. nice. um, I I never got to play the board game. Although I have a a friend who was really close, and just a couple months ago, he was telling me that he just got into D and D in mm. our thirties, and I was like, Bro, I'm impressed. I mean, <laughs> got into it this late, so I think it's possible. So. Can you D and D pill me and and the audience? Oh, yeah, and, uh, you know I'm I'm very familiar with. I can say R. A. Salvatore especially and the Drist Duerden series. If you're ever familiar, he popularized, for example, the positive spin on the Dark Elves, who always had a bad rep before him, and right. now it's like a trope that there's a good, there's always a good Dark Elf. Yeah, <laughs> I honestly like I'm shocked that I never actually read one of his books. Um, I don't know why, 
couldn't tell you, but um, I know the Forgotten Realms because I played uh, Baldur's Gate. Like, yep. as a kid, like, I love this game. So that's is really where this starts, is that... He's an unlockable character in Dark Alliance 2. Oh, And he's nice. the main character in the latest Dark Alliance they released for uh, PS4 and 5. I have not played that, but I might have to pick it up. Um, so I got Baldur's Gate literally randomly. Like, it just came in a bundle when back when they bundled software and gave it to you with your computer. Um, and I just, like, was like, what is this? Like, I'm going to put it in, see what happens. And, like, you know, three years later, I was still playing the game. <laughs> there's just so much content it was like the it's like skyrim now but like back then and you know there's just like hundreds of hours of like side quests and all these things and so what's cool about Baldur's gate is that like you said it's in the forgotten realms but two it's D, &D based so um it's actually like you know the rules of D, &D but in a video game um and so that like sent me off and so i was always like a book lover as a child um i spent a lot of time at like books a million and barnes and noble and the library and same eventually i found like the D, &D section and i was like what is this and then i was like oh yeah that's the thing from Baldur's gate and so i picked up like a the starter board game? kit yeah oh, okay. like you know it's the system that they built it on and so um this was when, this was right when the third edition of D&D came out. Um, and so I got the starter kit, I got the rule books, and I just started reading them because, like, I didn't have anyone to play with. Like, I had friends, but, like, this is, like, serious business. <laughs> it's like, you got to, like, <laughs> read a lot of stuff and understand. Yeah. It's like, you know, people complain about board game rules that are long, like, these days, but, like, it's nothing like D&D, like... Now, luckily, lately, like you, your friends just joining a D and D campaign, it's a lot easier to get started now. It's like going through a golden age, because like the latest edition simplified a lot of things, and it's just becoming popular. Um, and so, like, I never really got to play for a long time. Um, I read the books as a kid and like played games that were based off of it, but um, it wasn't until like high school where I really got to play at least a little bit, but not a regular campaign. It was mm -hmm. just like, we would play like a little battle between like some characters we made or whatever. Um, or like maybe play the starter thing, but it was never like a continuous like week after week. But then like in my twenties, I finally found a group of people. Like I worked at a coffee shop and these people were talking about D and D and I was like, it's like, I got to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot your shot. Yeah. And so like, it turned out they were like starting a game. And so I started playing with them and, you know, it just, that became like a regular group that I played for years with. Um, we kind of stopped around the pandemic and mm -hmm. I haven't picked it up since, but I need to play again. With, were there no long. Zoom, uh, like, is, can, can it be done over Zoom or Google Meet? It can be. It's just not the same, man. Yeah. So there's a thing called Roll20, which is like an online um, program that's basically built just for like tabletop games. And so you can play D&D on it. It's pretty nice. It's got like all the roles and stuff built in. And it's nice because like you don't have to do as much math. Um, uh -huh. So, you know, there's like stuff to add and subtract and things like that or multiply. And so people sometimes don't like doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say there's two different ways you can do that. So you, you can have like an online generated version or you can just use online communication, but you're still doing it physically. Like yes. you pick one of you to move it all. Right. So we kind of did that for a bit. It just, it was okay. It just, I think it fell apart for other reasons. Um, but yeah, I think I prefer to play in person for sure. It's just yeah. nice to like, you're all around the table. There's like dice being thrown. It's like something big happens. You're just like, ah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, li live anything is bad. I was just listening to a podcast comparing live comedy versus watching comedy, you know, at mm. home on your TV and, uh, you know, watching a movie on Netflix at home versus seeing it in IMAX. Like, no, there's still something in the face-to-face -face that's, oh, yeah. that's missing. There's no doubt about that. And, um, 
I I barely, barely, barely dabbled into a League of Legends, but I see that you're nice. also a, a team fight tactics uh, fan, and I hadn't I hadn't looked into that. But going back to your discussion of Baldur's Gate, I've played a number of different RPG games, and some are like co like in Knights of the Old Republic for mm -hmm. the Star Wars, and like Baldur's Gate originally were purely turn-based and over time the ones that i liked the most were like the real-time strategy games like be it starcraft or diablo where it allowed you to have an extra sense of duress and stress because you have to make those decisions in real time <laughs> as opposed to getting like all the time in the world like even i'm an avid chess fan and i haven't signed up for the chess app of urban so i'm gonna have to do that and try to get ranked there as the rankings uh, nice. grow up. I'm, I'm not the best, but I'm pretty good. Nice. And for me, like playing someone with an unlimited rule set is something I could no longer do because after high school being in chess club, the minimum, or let me say like the longest amount of time I would play is 15 or 20 minutes on the clock. Mm -hmm. And if they're not even to like make you like super tense, like a blitz game of one minute, but it's there to have some realism of like, dude, we're not going to spend three hours on this. Right. <laughs> the idea of email chess that some of my friends do is just, I, I couldn't handle something like that because I'm a guy that gets distracted and email mm. chess, I'm already thinking about too many other things. So <laughs> I, I wonder if you could tell us about uh, TFT or team fight tactics and that, because is it more turn-based or, or is it real time? And, and what do you think about those two kind of genres? So TFT games? is turn-based. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a timer, so like it's not forever. Uh, it's like it's it's weird because like it's turn based, but everybody is on the same timer. So it's like you gotta set up your stuff and then like your hands off while they like fight. Um, it's nice because it feels more casual than like um, like a normal League of Legends match where it is like actually real time. It's kind of funny that you brought that up because like I just started playing League of Legends again. <laughs> um i don't know i've been in the mood for like something real time and something that i can just pick up and play for like 30 minutes and then leave it um i don't know that as the the more i grow older it's like any game that like requires a ton of time like commitment is just like it just feels like a burden like i'm like oh i really want to finish that game but like i have to compete with like other you know responsibilities and all this stuff so um yeah, I don't know. Like, kids I don't have responsibilities who are on their. Yeah. <laughs> um, I prefer. I prefer your style too. Like, I. I also get, too caught up. I think that was like, the majority of my younger years were just like, just thought, overthink everything and thought too much. And I still do it today, but like, it's way better now. <laughs> yeah. Um. Chess, like I said, is inherently turn-based, but you can play with a clock, which makes mm -hmm. it more like TFT. I've always been a lifelong martial artist. I say that, but I took like a decade off and the past five years or so, four or five years uh, on and off, I've been doing jujitsu very seriously. And the oh, thing nice. about jujitsu, they call it chess with your body, is that it like there's one thing about knowing something theoretically, like you're talking about knowing computer science theoretically versus, you know, in the real world, you have deadlines and you have shipments, yeah. <laughs> and teams and everything. So jujitsu, you can study it. You could read a book, you could watch video instructionals. But the thing is, you know, you are in the moment and everyone handles stress differently. Mm -hmm. And even like how much sweat you have, how deep you are into it, how exhausted you are, your nutrition, all those things affect your ability to think and one of the things that it does is it's like the real-time strategy games because you have to you have to think about it yeah. <laughs> and the consequence is not just like a digital figure uh <laughs> going away. you're like oh shoot i'll go back and beat that boss again but it's like it's your body <laughs> right yeah it's funny actually so i used to do i did karate for like uh like five or six years when i was a kid nice. um and yeah i mean i i loved it I got kind of burnt out at the end because I was doing other sports and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I've been thinking lately about picking it up again. So I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> you brought up my my dad is never finished, but he was like a brown belt in Shotokan karate. Mm -hmm. I when I was that age, I did taekwondo. 
Um, it's the Korean version, and karate is the Japanese version, and uh, they're pretty similar. But I think Taekwondo is a little more kick oriented and uh, karate a little more punch, although I think they, they both do that. And I credit it to flexibility. So I assume you still, if you're not the most flexible guy, you're probably more flexible than the average guy. With probably, I don't know. It's a good question, <laughs> dude. I'm telling you the 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 age range you're talking about. Having done karate, I I would bet. You know, I'm not. I don't expect you to be like a, a yogi, but I I would bet yeah. you're at. You'd be surprised. I'll tell you, there are even MMA people who I've seen like professionals in the yeah. UFC who can't kick above their waist level. Okay, that yeah, I can definitely kick. <laughs> like if I hold my hand like this, I can usually hit it. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's dude, that's not normal. I, and when I say normal, like that's not the average. You right. Know? Yeah, I, that's I true. That I had a split for a long time, and man, I lost it. And it's like even now, trying to go close to it, I'm like, oh, this hurts. <laughs> <laughs> you can work back at it again. Um, I know. Right before we were recording, I was uh, joking and telling you about uh, my my passion for languages. I do a lot of stuff with languages on this uh, program too. And um, I was even um, with some Spanish speakers today and they were convinced I was either Cuban or Dominican. And when I told wow. them I was African instead, they were, they were caught off guard. They're like, why do you know Spanish? And I like, hey, I, you know, just grew up around it. But um, I mentioned to you that I, I picked up Hebrew and I'm still a very much a beginner in Hebrew, but I, the alphabet is like 22 letters. So I, I learned two letters a day for 11 days and I committed to that and, and I picked it up and, you know, there's something to the fact that you picked up Hoon and I don't know what languages and computer languages you knew before that, but there's something to the methodical nature of putting in like 30 minutes to 50 minutes to an hour, whatever your practice is every day and building it up that I think there's some relation between computer languages and, and spoken languages. So if you <laughs> if you had any uh, thoughts on Hebrew or any other spoken languages that you've studied in high school or, or anything, that would be cool to add too. Sure. Um, so I should say I have not learned Hoon yet. I mean, I've, I've gone through a lot of it. Um, I'm actually going to be doing Hoon school too. So Oh, nice. Um, yeah, it'll be good. Like I need to learn it. Like I do a lot of all the front end stuff, but like, um, it's, it's, there's nothing like knowing the language that something is written in to really like understand like the structure and the architecture. Um, mm -hmm. And it goes both ways, right? Like for computer science and for languages, like I think I've never, I don't know another language fluently enough to like really read a book. Um, but I could imagine the complete like difference it would be reading that versus like a translation. Yeah. Um, so like, I know, uh, a bit of French. Um, I took a few years in high school and like, that's a big thing where I live. I live in Louisiana. So it's a cultural thing. Like we came from, you know, like basically Canada. Um, but it was Acadie or the Acadian people, um, who came down to Louisiana basically. And so that's like a big thing around here. A lot of people speak French. Uh, my wife speaks. I didn't know that. I didn't almost know. Almost fluent French. Wow. French. Because <laughs> she went to like immersion. Um, there's like some French immersion programs. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, and there's like a lot of, you know, a lot of old people who can fluently flip between French and English. Although they speak Cajun French, which is like a bit yeah. different than like your standard, you know, Parisian French or whatever. Yeah, it's it's a, it. it's a dialect, which I'm sure they would yeah, understand sure. the, the high French or whatever it's called. Right. Um, so there's that. I also, at some point, I don't, I have no idea. I couldn't tell you why, but like, I, I wanted to learn Russian. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess because like, they seem to have people that are just like, so, like brilliant and like, especially at computers. And so, I mean, there's other reasons too, but anyway, so like I, I learned the sort of like alphabet, um, mm -hmm. actually really enjoyed that a lot. And I started to learn the language, but I fell off, man. I didn't, I didn't keep going with the 30 minutes every day. Yeah. <laughs> it, it happens, you know, you have to be driven by your passion and your curiosity. I remember listening and uh, finding out from this guy at NASA that, you know, to get into NASA, you have to know Russian. And I thought that was so weird. Like I never 
I never oh, thought wow. that an American government agency would would compel that unless like you know right. there, it's like a specific spy thing. And um, you know, I had I had the founder of Urban on a couple times of on my podcast, not to talk about Urban at all, actually. Mm. Um, but one of the things he mentions a lot in politics about the Soviet Union is that uh, the the categories that are typically in the social sciences and the humanities, if you look at all the things that they produced, are pretty much all bullshit. But if you look at the things that were as close to reality as possible, they excelled in. Like you mentioned computers, I would add to that chess. And for my strength training concerns, I go to the old Soviet trainer who's been in the U.S. since I think the 80s or 90s. He introduced a kettlebell here, Pavel mm. Sosovan. And yeah. I do all this kettlebell work based off of him. So the Russians were great at like, you know, strength training, chess and computers. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do a bit of strength training, too. <laughs> although not kettlebells. I do like uh, like barbell. They, they have modalities. Pavel has a, a, he calls them the three modalities that he thinks are the most relevant for depending on what you want to do, body weight, barbell, or or kettlebell. And when I was much younger, I was definitely all, uh, you know, uh, about the, uh, I just said it and I forgot it. The barbell. The, the barbell. Yeah, yeah, I was all about the barbell. If I wasn't doing a sport right now, I would do the barbell because there's no replacement for maximum strength. I do the kettlebell to balance like max strength with not depleting myself and then right. you know obviously the body weight would deplete you the less but you also can't get as strong as with the other two yeah for sure um yeah that's it's been a constant battle with that too like there's so many times where like i'll go out of this long stint and then like i'll hit a two or three week period where like just life happens or whatever mm -hmm. happens and then like I fall out of the routine and then like it's it's like a few months before i get back onto it it just, just depends but yeah um i don't have any yes, impressive numbers because that's the that's the twitter the twitter discourse uh yeah, especially man. in asim taleb twitter is is deadlift or do you even deadlift bro deadlift is my favorite for sure <laughs> <laughs> um it's definitely my strongest but i still have a long ways to go Okay, well that that's nice. That's awesome. I I look forward to looking uh to to learning Hoon with you. I certainly hope I don't fall off that I, I <laughs> go through with it all the way. I know you're bringing your other expertise. Um I've I studied a little bit of the QA side and scrum side and I've dabbled in kind of online boot camps, but I've never just had the the time because of having to just work full time to go all in on it. So I'm I'm hoping that the opportunities that you and I discussed here that are opening up are presenting in the lane and I wanna do anything I can to increase the amount of people who are adopting it and learning it. And I think port, especially the comet on there is just the easiest thing for people to swallow to get on it. And then hopefully they they get hooked and, and do everything else. As, as we head out here, is there anything else you wanted to say? Any words of wisdom or advice or two cents or a quote that you like? Oh, man. <laughs> hmm. Um, I'll, I'll give a recommendation. Um, okay. And that's uh, The Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander. It's um, an, uh, he was an architect. And so he wrote this book with a companion book called a pattern language and his his goal was to talk about like how do you build something of high quality and like what even is quality and he explores this throughout the book and it's he approaches it from you know building a building but it's a it's applicable to everything like your life or like software or whatever um and honestly like to me, it's it's a it's a another form of like a Bible in a way. It's like really like a philosophy. Um, and so, if you have a chance, if you have any interest in that, like, go read it. Like, to me, that's kind of it encapsulates a lot of like the ideals of Urbit inside of it. Thank you, Hunter. This has been beautiful. Yeah, this was great, man.